So this presentation is about how to distinguish between different types of variables. So this is from module three of the OLI textbook and also module three of the workbook, topic two in the workbook on variable types. This is around pages nine to 11 of the OLI textbook. And it's, it's a subject that seems to be a little simpler than it actually is. Um, and so what I want to do in this presentation is to just sort of head off the misunderstandings that I've seen students have in the past. And so it's, it's about uh, 12 slides. It'll take maybe half an hour, a little bit less. And uh, here we go. So this chart here with different types of variables. Um, so the two main categories are the qualitative versus the quantitative. Now, qualitative, it's about a quality of the individual. It's the kind of variable that when you measure it, you just get the name of a category. Okay, like the population might be the set of all the personal computers being used by people in the class. And so each individual would be a computer. And what you would measure about each individual would be the manufacturer. So is it an Acer or an Apple or a Sony or whatever? Or the individuals in your population might be city college students, the set of all city college students. Each individual is a student what you measure about each individual might be their mar marital status. So when you measure this kind of variable about an individual, the value of the variable is gonna be just the name of a category. So the qualitative variables are sometimes called categorical. Now a quantitative variable is also called a numerical variable. And that just means when you measure it about an individual, you get back a number. So it might be how many brothers and sisters do you have? Or how much do you weigh in pounds? And these quantitative or numerical variables separate into two categories, discrete versus continuous. And why do we care about categorical versus discrete versus continuous? Well, it matters because some of the formulas that we use and some of our choices about what type of graph to make depend on what type of variable we're looking at. And so we need to be able to distinguish among these in order to pick the right formula or the right type of graph later. Okay, now you may see from the examples here in the, in the chart what makes the difference between discrete and continuous. If you look at these discrete variables like the number of children in a family, the number of strokes on a golf hole, the number of TV sets that a person owns. I keep saying the number of this, the number of that. A discrete variable, when you measure it, the value that you get for an individual is always a whole number. But with a continuous variable, you might your individuals might be students at City College and the variable that's being measured might be the weight of each student 
And when you measure the weight of an individual, the number values that you get might be fractions. Or even if you think about distances, you're, maybe you're measuring how tall is a person. And distances, as, as you may have learned in geometry, they could even be irrational numbers, not even fractions at all, like the square root of two feet. And so the numbers, the set of numbers that includes all of the whole numbers and their negatives and all of the fractions and all of the irrational numbers in between the fractions, that big set of all possible distances or all possible weights or pressures, temperatures, that set of numbers is, is the set of real numbers. So when you measure a continuous variable for an individual, the value of the variable will turn out to be a real number, not just whole numbers, maybe including whole numbers. And the scratched out part over here is a mistake. All right. Now, if I just stopped at this slide, you would feel that the distinction between the discrete and the continuous is very clear. And I need to point out a few subtleties about this. So superficially, the distinction is very simple. When you measure a discrete variable, you get whole number quantities. When you measure a continuous variable, the value could have many digits out to the right of the decimal point. But a few examples will show you that it's also necessary to think about your mental model for the thing that you are measuring. So here's a, a fictitious debate about the length of a piece of chalk. When we met in the classroom, I used to get students to take a position on this, and debate a little bit. But it boils down to this kind of an argument. So is the length of a piece of chalk a continuous variable or is it discrete? The answer depends how you think about it. Student one might say the length is continuous because it does not have to be a whole number. You can have fractions of an inch. Straightforward. And student two says, aha, but if you count the atoms instead of inches, the length is going to be a whole number. It's kind of silly, but that's also true. Okay. The debate continues. Student one says, yes, but the atoms and molecules are squishy. So if you squeeze it, you get back to fractional lengths. And then student two goes off the deep end and says, oh, he's heard about this loop quantum gravity theory where space itself might be in discrete little chunks, nothing in between. You're either here or here. So we're not getting anywhere because the debate it's not really about the chalk. It's a question about what mathematical model you want to use for the chalk. How do you want to represent the length? Are you gonna allow fractions or not? You might be able to go back and forth forever about what it, quote, really is. But the question is not about the chalk, it's about what type of variable do you want to use to suit your purposes. Now let's do this with a number of chairs in a classroom. Let X be the number of chairs in a randomly selected classroom at City College. Is X continuous or discrete? And the answer depends on your intended use for the variable. Student one says, I want to order chairs. They only come in whole numbers. I'll use a discrete variable. 
who says, I want to ship the chairs by UPS. They charge by weight. So I need to count fractions of chairs. You know, some of them are missing a wheel or something. Okay. So student two wants to use a continuous variable and allow for all those little fractions. It's not that one's right and the other's wrong. It's they have different purposes in mind. It's not about the chair. It's about the type of variable that they wish to use. But here's an example where sort of by definition, there's no debate. Let X be the annual taxable income of a randomly selected taxpayer. Is X continuous or is it discrete? Wrong idea here. You mean, you might think that it's continuous because you could earn $45,000.32 for your income. You don't necessarily get a whole number and you might be thinking to yourself that makes it continuous, but it does not. A variable is discrete if you always get whole numbers provided that the units of measurement are small enough. If there's any little unit of measurement that you can use so that then you always get whole numbers, that's discrete. And so here, if you measured the income in cents rather than in dollars, then it's always a whole number. So this is a discrete variable. You see, a continuous variable would be where in your model, in your mind, for your purposes, you think that the digits after the decimal point might go on forever. If you thought it might be possible to earn 35,131.32597643 digits on and on forever, if you thought, you know, whether or not you, you could measure it, if you thought that was possible, then in your mind, you're using a continuous variable. But with income for tax purposes, it cuts off at the cents. And so if there comes a point where some unit of measurement, hundreds of a dollar in this case, but some units of measurement are small enough that you only ever get whole numbers, if those units exist, then it's a discrete variable. Now, if I ask you, is the weight of a football player continuous or discrete? Most of you would say it's continuous because in principle, small fractions of a pound are possible. And I would agree with you. It doesn't matter if you go to ounces or, you know, milligrams or whatever. In principle, weight is the kind of thing that divides up into very tidy fractions. So I could say, okay, thinking of that as a continuous variable is, is okay. We're not going to count the atoms. Great. So we all agree on that. But see, I, I could trick you. See, and I found this out the hard way. I didn't intend to trick anybody, but on a test, I, I gave this example. And they had a table of data there on the test. And so they looked at it. And that was a mistake, because the question's not about the data, it's about the variable itself. They looked at that table of numbers and they saw that in the data table, they were all whole numbers. And so they said, this is discrete because the data is all whole numbers. No, 
maybe maybe these guys were just being weighed on a bathroom scale and it was not very accurate, you know? Or maybe when the data was written down, recorded in the notebook, maybe whoever wrote it down only only chose to write it down to the nearest pound because they did not want to keep writing down all the little digits that come after that. See, the question's not about the data itself. It's about whether in principle, if you had a really good scale, does their actual weight have the little fractions or not? If you think the actual weight cuts off somewhere, then you would go discrete, but we don't think the weight cuts off at the nearest pound or tenth of a pound. We think if you had a good enough scale, you could measure a lot of digits, as many as you want, and that doesn't matter whether you're using pound or ounces or whatever. So there's not any unit of measurement where eventually it only comes in whole numbers. And that makes it a continuous variable. Even though the data looks discrete, we don't care about the data. In fact, data is always discrete, even when the variable is continuous. Here's some data about the concentration of lead arsenate insecticide in wine. And it's continuous because we imagine that if you just had a good enough measuring device, you could measure this with many, many digits of accuracy. As many as you can afford to, to pay for when you're, you're building this measuring device. Now you look at the data table over here. It cuts off at the nearest one hundredth of a milligram. But it only cuts off because, well, you can't write down infinitely many digits. You had to cut it off somewhere, and your measuring device was only so good. So after a certain point, the, whatever digits it would show would just be fiction because it's not that precise. Data always has to cut off somewhere. Sure, you could turn these numbers into whole numbers by using micrograms per liter instead of milligrams, then you get all whole numbers for your data, but that doesn't make the variable itself continuous. It just means the data is continuous. The, 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 the data is discrete, but the variable is continuous. Now, most languages use grammar to divide the whole world up into different types of variables. In English, I'd ask, how much water do you want? And I use the word much because volume's a continuous variable for most purposes. And in English, I'd ask, how many tacos do you want? And I use the word many because the number of tacos is a discrete variable for most purposes. So that's all I have to say about, about different types of variables. And so I'll see you in the next video, which will be on topic three, about levels of measurement. And then that's the last of the three topics in module three. And we'll go on to module four from there. Module four is a longer module. It has a lot of topics, not just three. It's 15 or something like this. Okay, see you next time.